Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to our latest program on the issue of um, let's talk about Palestine. Uh, we have two very uh, interesting and important guests uh, with us, um, and they have uh, their own experiences in terms of uh, being in Palestine uh, and and, uh, and having conversations here uh, in the United States on these issues. The first is Imam Rashad Abdul Rahman from the Atlanta Masjid uh, of uh, Al Islam, and uh, Imam uh, Abdul Rahman is uh, also responsible for teaching and implementation of uh, of Masjid and community programs. Welcome, uh, Imam Abdul Rahman. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Is it Rahman or Rahma? Uh, Rahman. Rahman. Okay, I think there's a typo. Uh, yeah. Use us on that. We'll get that. We'll get oh, that. No problem. We'll get that created. How are you doing today? Uh, alhamdulillah. Good. Good. How about you? Good. Alhamdulillah. Well, welcome. I just wanted our, you to tell our audience, you know, what what you've been working on in terms of Masjid Al Islam in Atlanta. I know it's one of the more more prominent mosques in the United States. Every time I talk to somebody, Rami Nashashibi from Chicago, yes, or yes. somebody here in, uh, named Mohamed Malas from Orange County, they're telling me they're they're going to uh, uh, Masjid Al Islam in in Atlanta. So tell yes. us about about the the programs there and the community programs that you have. Well, Bismillahir uh, uh, Rahmanir Rahim, uh, with God's name, the Merciful Benefactor, the Merciful Redeemer. Again, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, I'm, I serve currently as the uh, assistant imam or associate imam uh, of Atlanta Masjid of Al Islam, and they have us really, uh, according to the, the to the numbers, we, we're really considered the largest African American uh, Muslim uh, masjid, and we do a lot. We do a little bit of everything from convert care um, to we have a full time school that goes from uh, kindergarten through twelfth grade. Um, we do uh, just a range of courses on Sira, uh, ad advanced, introductory, uh, Arabic, Quranic Arabic, Tajweed. We run a HIF uh, program. So we have a lot of things, I think, that are pretty much, um, I would say, standard masjid programming um, to service the community. You know, um, from a, we do food pantry work, things of that nature. Um, and then as well, we have youth organizations, we have health and wellness organizations, just a range of things to serve uh, the community needs uh, for, for, for the population here uh, in Atlanta. And, um, you know, when it comes to the issue of Palestine and Atlanta, it's something mm -hmm. very interesting that I, I, I hear and, and try to deconstruct it for us. What I hear, especially from uh, African American pastors, Christian leaders, um, is that because the Jewish community supported Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. uh, and that they were, they were supporting the civil rights movement, um, they are more uh, beholden not beholden, but they're more uh, have more affinity uh, to the uh, to the pro-Israel community. Uh, John Lewis, for example, a, a congressman there, uh, was one of the strongest supporters of Israel. And I always wondered how how that uh, reconciled in terms of civil rights work here and where we see obvious human and civil rights violations done right. against the Palestinians over there. H how do you navigate that with uh, with African-American Christian leaders? Well, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I haven't been on this show before, so I'm going to be just myself. So <laughs> uh, we meeting. want <laughs> very, very straightforward conversation. Yeah, I, I think that um, that type of response from African American leadership from the church uh, and in government is more political, politically motivated than it is motivated by the um, urge to be truthful. Um, it, it, you know, there, there are always trade offs, um, there are always things to consider when speaking in the public. And I think that a lot of our leaders, frankly, are not free to think or speak. Um, they, in other words, they operate and they speak in a manner that is um, appropriate for their particular office that they hold or the spot that they have in society. So they're not allowed to really speak from their um, genuine human selves. I don't, I don't think that it's a, complicated matter 
as it pertains to the Palestinian issue. And we, from the history of African Americans, we have a, we believe that we have, this is sort of a ubiquitous feeling that all of us share, be you black African American Muslim, Christian, or any other thing, we sort of, we sort of identify with the plight of oppressed peoples. Um, so we talk about this around our dinner tables uh, with our non-Muslim family members. It's just something that's known in the air of black life. So that type of language in that orientation, I just don't think it's all the way genuine. And, and, and there's another thing too that I'll just add. Um, it's nuanced. Um, the Jewish community is not homogenous. I mean, they're people. And you have different types of, of, of Jews. And I think oftentimes um, when, when discussion is had about the relationship between the black community and the Jewish community, as an example, we're yeah. speaking about a particular type, a particular group among the broader Jewish community. I don't, and, 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 and the merit and the credit that those ones that helped us in our work, for, such as civil rights, um, that doesn't cancel out or that really doesn't have to that that doesn't play a major part in how we view for example uh zionism uh many black leaders even during that time were against the zionist movement because they saw it as an extension of the colonialist uh and from our perspective the the jim crow ethos of, of western society uh that's a, that's an important uh distinction to make uh and unfortunately, in, in our society today, there's a conflation of Zionism and Judaism, or let, let me put it more accurately, that anti-Zionism anti now is equated with anti-Semitism. Right. Um, and and it's, it's, it's creating tension, obviously, especially with the Muslim community, I imagine with a lot of the social justice uh, and peace and justice uh, uh, community that, that what we see in terms of Israel's behavior and policies towards the Palestinian Palestinians needs to be criticized um, as Americans, as people of faith, uh, and it needs to be changed. And if it requires pressure, then we have to apply pressure, especially since the United States is the number one financial, uh, military, uh, and political uh, sponsor, uh, political sponsor, meaning political protection in international uh, arenas uh, to, you know, and for, uh, the state of Israel. So how do you suggest we navigate uh, that issue as, as forget about being Muslim, just being people of conscience uh, who, who want to have an American or a U.S. policy that uh, is more aligned with human rights? I think we lost your voice. Okay. Well, uh, as we work to bring uh, Imam Rashad back, uh, uh, let us uh, bring on Sam. Uh, there you are, Sam. Hi, Sam. I'm, I'm very well. How are you? I'm 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 okay despite the uh, the state of the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Sam is an entrepreneur and humanitarian co-founder, advisor, board member of System, a global market maker and software development company that provides projects and institutions uh, the expertise, flexibility, and transparency they need to succeed. Uh, and Sam is of Palestinian background, uh, and he's also a member of our Hollywood Bureau. So we wanted uh, uh, Sam to uh, uh, come on and, and have a conversation with me and uh, Imam Rashad, as soon as we can get him back, I think we're having some technical difficulties. But Sam, I, I don't know if you were listening to my conversation with the Imam I was. I was. Uh, about these issues. How, how do we navigate that in, in your sector, in your, your neck of the woods? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are multiple ways to, to go about it. And I think the imam actually touched upon something important that we always have to remember, and that is nuance. Um, there are many ways to look at this, and two opposing ideas can be true at the same time. Unfortunately, we've digressed into a situation where we're shouting at each other, we're using triggering words. We're using uh, things that shut down the conversation. Uh, currently, I'm reading uh, the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. and meeting with uh, a number of uh, millennials and Gen Zers uh, who do not look at this conflict and who do not look at this current state of events 
as something that uh, we have succeeded in being able to get our points across. And there are many reasons for that. However, we are in a situation now where you've spread because of the Nakba and Nakba, you've spread the best, brightest individuals all around the world. I'm first generation, born in Chicago. Uh, I'm American, you know, culturally American. I look at the world from a worldview that is more holistic. Uh, I've traveled to over 40 countries. I've been in multiple uh, industries, including why I came to Los Angeles in the first place, to be in the film industry, to work in film. My first business partner was Jewish. We started Olive Branch Productions to tell socially aware films. So everything that I've ever done from, from wanting to go to law school, which to my father's chagrin, I went to the film industry in, instead, to, to uh, the entrepreneurial uh, endeavors that I've, I've embarked upon, uh, they all lead back to one thing, and it's how do we make the world a better place and how do we make the world equitable? And that, is, that starts with the mutual respect that we must give to one another. Uh, save that, all we're doing is shouting, and we are not really making progress to where we want to go and where we foresee uh, the world to be. And and how, how how are you dealing with that as a Palestinian in your sector? Well, so, I mean, I started in the film industry. Uh, I started writing scripts in 2005. I optioned a couple of screenplays. Uh, I came and worked for a company called Spotlight Pictures and, and uh, Strategic Film Partners. Oftentimes, as you know, Hollywood is sort of, especially right now, very split. But when I first entered into the, into the fray in 2005, 2006, um, you know, my name doesn't connotate uh, uh, an Arab name necessarily. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people would find out that I'm Palestinian and they, they would tell me, I, you're not what I expected. Uh, so I try to lead by example. I try to lead by the fact that I am a critical thinker. Uh, and I think that I approach that in every industry that I'm in. Uh, in the blockchain industry where I've, I've found success, I closed my Series A last year on a company that I co-founded, which you mentioned, System 9. Uh, every single industry that I embark upon, I bring my, my identity to, to, to the forefront in order for it to showcase that we are not a monolith. Nothing is a monolith, in fact. There is multiple ways of looking at any situation and at any people. And I always say this, on a long enough timeline, nothing exists. Not the United States of America, not Islam, not Judaism, not, but what does exist? Our common humanity. And our common humanity is what we need to actually start leaning into as globalization continues to occur, as the information paradigm, the internet, continues to proliferate. And we've seen now that the misinformation and disinformation of that information paradigm is creating a, a schism in, in, our, in our reality. And that's why you see the, the fake news. And now we have to triple check, quadruple check things, look at what is being omitted and i challenge you know both sides all sides to look at that and to empirically look at the evidence before making judgment and not to categorize people in a way that shuts down conversation and i think that really is the crux of it if you think that you are not going to be able to have to speak to the other side well you're sadly mistaken and every single major conflict from gandhi in india he had to deal with the british from Nelson Mandela in South Africa, he had to deal with the Afrikaners. From uh, Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X, they had to deal with, with the, the powers that be here in the United States. So if anyone thinks that we're gonna unilaterally do this or that, as we have seen throughout history for the last several decades, that does not work and that is not the path forward. And this is why I have buried myself in the teachings of Martin Luther King, in the teachings of Nelson Mandela, in the teachings of Gandhi, because that is the way forward and that is the way for, uh, for us to have a better future. Uh, yeah, and, and especially in America, it's the only way forward. It's it's through these great leaders, as you mentioned, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King um, uh, in, in America. Uh, Imam Rashad, thank you for, uh, please, uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties. I know we lost you for a few minutes, but I'm glad you're back. Uh, you know, in, in, you know in, in, in response to Sam's points uh, about uh, following the, the footsteps of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, what would they say today if they saw what we are seeing and and they saw our president behave the way he's behaving by declaring himself a Zionist uh, and they see that so many of us are being um, targeted and intimidated, you know, to just not not 
you know, not convert, but to accept that Zionism is, uh, uh, to put it bluntly, has become the law of the land. If the Congress right. uh, saying that we have to accept Zionism and 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 some of you know some of our faith leaders uh, are pressured not to say anything uh, about that, uh, how do we navigate that? How do we how do we address that from a political and a religious uh, perspective? Yes. Um, well, the, the short answer is I believe both uh, Dr. King and Malcolm El Haj Malik Shabazz, may, may God forgive him his sins and grant him paradise. I, I do believe that both of them would be in unison in terms of being vehemently against the position of our president. Um, you know, what, what's unique about both of them, uh, seemingly, at least on the surface, they start off sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but at the end of their lives, as leaders, they become more and more universal in their outlook, yeah. um, addressing the human condition. And I think that Sam really hit it right on the mark regarding our common humanity. Um, the world has become more humanly sensitive, whether it wants to or not. We can't help it. We can turn, we can literally, I'm on the phone right now. My, my computer has a, a bug on it. I'm actually on the phone and I'm able to talk to you all from your respective locations and there are persons watching us from their respective locations. So that, that augments and it makes more complex the, the, this, this dynamic that's occurring in this modern time of, sim, of connectivity, human connectivity. Because we're in a time such as this, the only ideology, the only thought system or belief system or way of being that is really um, fit, fit, properly fit to survive and, and benefit us all in this time uh, are those ideas that put emphasis on our common human value, our common human life. And I think that from a, this may be philosophical, but I think that what we're, we have really been experiencing in these late, late times are just growing pains. Um, we're coming out of the colonial era. Um, we're still in it to some, in, to, to a large extent, as it pertains to uh, economic colonialism and, and things of that nature. So there's going to be some growing pains, but it, it, it seems as though the world, in its not in, in its motion, where it currently is, it is forcing us to become more human. And because that is the case, um, justice has to really be justice. It can't be justice just from the viewpoint of America. It has to be universal justice. Mercy and compassion really has to be mercy and compassion. And I think that what the calling is for us as faith leaders, as community leaders, activists, is to be in touch with that spirit and to speak out, uh, to, to, to interject in this environment, that spirit as sort of an anecdote to this poison. Because I think that um, in conclusion, I think that a lot of these media outlets um, a lot of these pundits, they are actively working against the times. Um, we have to be actively working towards the advance of where this time is. And we have to be consciously, again, interjecting an anecdote to poison. Racism is a poison. Um, um, colonialism, any, any idea that puts one group above another group, in, in, in my group are superior to yours. So I have rights that you don't have. It's a poison. It's a cancer to humanity. So we have to be uh, medicine, modern day medicine men, I guess we can call ourselves. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That is great. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Rashad. Uh, Sam, uh, how, um, how do you see your sector in terms of, um, you know, wh where the pro-Israel voices are and and the social justice voices are because you know both in the faith community you know the space that imam rashad works in and in the hollywood sector in the in the space that you work in I, what i see is that the establishment is saying one thing and it's top down forcing everybody to align but from the bottom you see a groundswell of opposition because the nature of both Hollywood and the faith community is more intrinsically uh, 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 aligned with social justice. That was 
that's what drives us, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you see that dynamic playing out? Yeah, I think that we have to be truthful with the historical narratives that we we sort of are not agreeing upon, right? Uh, uh, you know, Imam talked about colonialism and talked about the, the idea of colonialism. So let's talk about that a little bit, right? The British and French mandate systems uh, are, are intrinsic to what happened in the Middle East and what is happening in the Middle East, that these, these decisions have long tails all across the board. Now, would you call the Jewish people fleeing from pogroms and fleeing from persecution and all that colonialists? I don't necessarily think that I would call them that. I would say that they are escaping from the worst type of atrocities worldwide. And, and you know, uh, Theodore Herzl in the first Zionist Congress, you know, this was a matter of where do we go to be safe? Now, has Israeli government, has, has it evolved into something that is, you know, has racist elements? Sure. Jake Tapper on CNN has said so much, right? He said that Ben Gavir and Smotrich and, and these other guys, these elements, but these elements are also a symptom of the entirety. So what you're seeing right now, and you've been seeing it in Hollywood, you saw it with Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz, you see it with, you know, other Jewish, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, icons, you know, there's other people such as, uh, you know, Seth Rogen talking about how we were fed a certain, uh, you know, sort of rhetoric. So I think we're, we're sort of having this reckoning, right, where everyone is so they're sort of surprised at the, this worldwide groundswell that's happening. But that's not so surprising. And, you know, every action that I see, even Israelis, you know, hardcore, you know, unfortunate, tragic, you know, uh, ways of looking at how to deal with Gaza is is, is stymied or mirrored in, in, in the foundation of how to deal with what they believe is, uh, you know, wanting to be wiped off the face of the earth. And historically, they're right. Historically, they have been persecuted in such a way. And, you know, there's all these people who deny the Holocaust, deny all this stuff. Like, there's enough evidence across the board that there is the anti-Jewish rhetoric that occurs everywhere. And I think what is happening when you're talking about the top and the bottom right now is that we need to be able to find mutual respect of being able to discuss one with one another. And I actually had a call this morning with a really amazing individual in Brooklyn. Uh, and, and it goes back to my point earlier, the individuals here who have now found success and who are uh, trying to find a way forward, whether they be pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, are genuinely trying to bridge those gaps. Uh, I, I, for one, you know, went to the Jewish temple in Venice a few weeks ago. I was the only Palestinian American in that room. Why? Because I am to build bridges. If I am eventually going to help push this into its final place of peace and tranquility and justice and dignity and safety for everyone there, then that is what we all have to do without shouting people down, without sitting there and saying, yes, this is, this is wrong or that is wrong. We can debate the, the, the historical narrative of the last hundred years plus all day long, but what is going on now? And where do we go from here? And I think that is where we have to start moving the conversation. The conversation has to stop with the triggering words, the dog whistling. All these other elements are just distracting. We need to eliminate them completely. And I think that's in any sector, but it's specifically Hollywood. And, you know, Hollywood in general has sort of lost a little bit of its luster, as we all know. Um, you know, the, the pandemic sort of uh, was, was, was uh, an eye-opening experience for a lot of people saying, hey, what really matters in life? and what really matters to us. And I think people, you know, as, as Hollywood or just the film industry has become more global, I think there's more perspectives that are happening. There's more, you know, just look at our, our, our current, uh, you know, Netflix channels. I mean, there's shows out of Korea and, and, and Israel and Russia and all these different places now that we can now look at other cultures. So there, there, it has to begin with a mutual respect and, and being able to speak to people in a way that says, hey, I'm not trying to trigger you. I'm not trying to create a place that makes you feel like, you know, I'm wiping one, one people out or another people out, but I am trying to find a place where we can sit down and have difficult dialogue. And whether it takes a day, a week, a month, or over a year, we don't leave that negotiation table until we resolve the issues that finally bring this to rest. Uh, Imam Rashad, you know, again, back to the to the religious community space in the Jewish yes. community, um, you know, we find individuals who are pro-Palestinian and want to support us and critical of Israel. But again, the higher you go up in terms of the organized Jewish community, 
uh, such as the American Jewish Committee, the Conference of Jewish Presidents, the Anti-Defamation League, they are very much uh, far away from any kind of compromise, if you will, uh, on, on this issue. Um, and whereas those who are more critical of Israel, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, from, from our standpoint, have no power. Right. They, they're individuals. They come, they, they sit with us, and they, they mourn with us, and they weep with us, but they have no influence uh, in the larger Jewish community. Or is that just a perception? Uh, you know that we need we need to correct ourselves. How how do we navigate the, that re, that religious community space with the Jewish community in particular? Yes, well, I, I do believe that there are uh, Jewish persons of influence um, in a in a in various uh, areas that do side with us. I, I think that or side with our general positions as as Muslim Americans. I was a guest recently of. Uh, the organization Sharaka, um, myself, several other members of the communities in association with Imam W.D. Muhammad, imams from, from, from several communities. We were the guests of the, really the Israelis. And um, we met a, a little bit of every, I mean, if, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a segment on its own, just what we encountered. But what we were able to pick up in general was the fact that even among the leadership, everyone doesn't see things the same way. Um, in the religious space, however, and, and uh, I really am of the opinion that the Muslims themselves have to regroup. I think that um, the best contribution that we can make is that we have to become, um, to, to, I'll use the word again, we have to become sensitized again by our religion based upon its best sources. And I think that hasn't happened. And because of that, we get what Sam is mentioning. We're, we're shouting at one another. Um, we're coming to the table simply wanting to be heard, but we don't want to hear. And I think if we study the strategies, not just the Prophet Muhammad, praise and peace be upon him in terms of just his direct teaching, but also his strategies as a leader, um, being able to build bridges, uh, for, form ties, and actually accept losses. He accepted at least what were apparent losses for the greater good. We've lost, not all of us, but I think far too many of us in religious leadership have lost that ethic, that wisdom. So we're ill-prepared in a lot of instances to really even engage our Christian or Jewish brothers and sisters to push dialogue forward. Sam, you have a question? I do, actually, Imam. I had a question, and, and, I, and I have a, I have a lot of Jewish friends and, and Jewish business partners, et cetera, and so we debate a lot, and one of my one of my really close friends is a top attorney in New York, and he's, you know, we, 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 we check each other, and he says, I keep him on his toes and, and whatnot, but he claims, and, and, and I don't know if I necessarily disagree with him, but do you believe that Islam is due for a reformation? Is it due for an, an, you know, an evolution into modern times, as it were? What do you feel about that question? How do you feel about you know, that, that type of you know, sort of thought process? Because really what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is that there, you know, there's 1.2 billion Muslims and a third of them are, are, are extremists or et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, well, my family's pretty large. My dad is one of 10. My mom is one of seven. I have 65 first cousins. None of them are extreme, uh, and and that and and I can I can extrapolate that across the board. Uh, you know, listen, do, do they have bad thoughts like we all do? Of course, that's 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 human nature. But what do you say to the idea that Islam may need a reformation or needs to be evolved in, in, this, in these modern times? Well, the, the short answer is I disagree. Uh, to say that the religion needs to be evolved could suggest, it doesn't have to, but it could suggest that it is lacking something that's not currently there. And Allah, he informs us in the Quran, you know, this day have I perfected for you, your religion. Um, the Who needs to be evolved, perhaps, are those who claim the religion. Um, and, and that's the, the, I would make that, and not to sound you know corny or cliche, but I think that that's a real thing. The average American, I would argue, is not in touch with the best of American values as they are expressed in the Declaration and the Constitution. So it's, it's as an analogy, I would say perhaps 
I don't think the average Muslim is a bad person. But I, again, I, I would say that perhaps the average Muslim isn't as sensitized to the full measure of the value and beauty of the Quran in prophetic tradition. Because we really have two movements in our history, more than two, but I'm, I'm separating it. We have the classical expression of Al-Islam beginning with our prophet and then those early generations. And then what we have is the formation of tradition. Um, in tradition, this is in Judaism, this is in Christianity, the Catholic church, they all have made this, um, they have all run into this problem. When you formulate, when you systematize, then in time, in time you ossify and you become a fossil. You don't adapt, you don't adjust. We see those early generations of Muslims being able to engage with the changes of the world and, and make necessary adjustments. I think that activity has just tapered off. And that is what really needs to be revived. I think that is Al-Islam. Uh, Al-Islam, as our, again, as our prophet in those early generations had it, it was addressing, it was meeting the immediate needs of the people at that time. Because of that, they were able to make progress. Um, for, for generations now, we haven't done that. So I think that the, the help, the special help that Muslims need uh, reform is suggesting that something needs to be formed over. Something's wrong. Um, so so I, I would say that we are in a, not all of us, but too many of us are in a kind of slumber, a slumber of tradition. Uh, and we need to awaken out of that. And I think if we awakened out of that, it's like uh, the people, the, the, the uh, Plato's cave. cave, you know, you come out of the cave and you see that it's a big, beautiful sun and a beautiful world out here. I think that that's, that I think we're in that time. I think that's what's actually happening yeah. in many spaces in the Muslim world. I, I want to go back though to, you know, you, you had said something that I'm sure that our, our community would find very uh, interesting uh, to, to understand more, that Israelis invited leaders of the Imam Warti Muhammad community. What was their motive? What was the outcome? Uh, what what are they trying to do? Because uh, to, to many of us, they we feel like they're trying to divide our community uh, with with these uh, uh, these these initiatives. So, can you give us a perspective on that, Imam Rashad? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm sure p perhaps uh, many of the listeners know, and you all have heard of the uh, the Abraham Accords and the organization Sharaka. They're really their work is is really based upon advancing what they see is these opportunities made available to the Israeli people by way of the Abraham Accords. To kind of put it in plain language, it, it, it seemed to us as they, they, they wanted to, they want to change their image and their position in the world because they want to ensure their um, well-being into the future. They need their inner region that is still hostile. And in order to change that, they need to make, they need to form alliances and relationships with Arab and Muslim countries. We were brought there. Um, this is my opinion. There may be even some members of our delegation um, who disagree with me, but I think we were brought there as uh, with the hopes to return here to the United States and make connections with other groups such as Impact, uh, Iman, and other faith leaders to really encourage them to get on board with the overarching agenda that, that um, stems from the Abraham Accords. So it, it was almost, it was almost like a, um, no, I won't say almost, it was. It was, this is Israel. This is where we want to go. This is how we want to approach the future. Can you help promote this at home to the Muslim community in the United States of America? Um, in a nutshell, I didn't think that was bad necessarily. Um, I think everyone has an interest. We had an interest when we went over there. Um, however, um, I, I think that that's where the issue of nu nuance comes into play. Uh, obviously, it's not that cut and dry uh, for us to just become ambassadors on behalf of Israel. I mean, that's never going to happen. I mean, obviously, to, to, you know, uh, but that's what it was. Now, but the Abraham Accords, one of the major criticisms is that Israel is trying to bypass uh, the Palestinians by trying to make deals with the Emiratis and the Saudis and 
you know, basically the Gulf countries and, and a few others. Right. Um, and and it's really about its treatment of the Palestinians. That's what's going to get, uh, for lack of a better term, acceptance is that if they offer the human rights uh, to the Palestinians, you know, in terms of what they deserve, but instead they bypass that and try to work with Gulf countries, work with your community, right. the African-American Muslim community, work with maybe some even Pakistanis or even a few others and 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 bypass the Palestinian issue. Did did that come up at all in your conversations with them? It did. It did. Um, that's the elephant in the room. Yeah. Um, I don't, it's impossible to have a conversation about Israel in its foreign relations without dealing with the Palestinian problem. It's just impossible. Um, so it came up. And, and to, to be honest, um, again, this is my opinion. I'm, 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 I'm aware of the fact that I'm a part of a delegation, but I'm, I'm uh, utilizing this moment to express a personal opinion. I've, I, my personal um, sensitivity was that the nature of the discussion flowed in one direction. There was a consistent emphasis of what the Palestinians need to do, how they should come to the table, what they need to do. Um, in my capacity as an imam and just a community worker, we do a lot of counseling. It can be parent, parent to child, husband and wife, um, co-workers even. No relationship can be can work that way and remain healthy. It always has to be, I did this wrong and I know I hurt you, but you did this to me. It has to be a two-way street. It can't, like I have a wife, you know, I can't just tell my wife, this is what you did wrong. I may not be married for much long. That, that can't be the dynamic of our marriage. So I sense that uh, that was sort of a constant refrain in the, in the discussion. And I think that uh, I was I, I actually had intention on suggesting that to them because they asked us for our feedback. What do you all think? How did we do? What suggestions do you have? And that, that that's why I'm comfortable sharing it here. That, that's one of them. You, 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 it's just in that's just not the nature of human relationships. I, if, if you all are married, you know, even when you think your wife is completely wrong, sometimes you have to say, yeah, you're right, baby, just to move the, the, the conversation down the road to get to a peaceful place. Sometimes you have to just concede, but when it's one-sided like that, you won't be successful ever. All right, thank you. Um, Sam, um, do you feel like you've been pushed out of the conversation because you're Palestinian? I could say in some cases I have been, and in other cases I have, I've been brought in, in fact, uh, through through our work through MPAC and the Hollywood Bureau. You know, there, there's there been multiple people and multiple entities here in Hollywood that reached out to me. And, and you know, I I'm consulted on a very big show, one of the largest show, running shows in, in history. Uh, their, their season premiere is going to be on Israel and Palestine. So them coming to me and asking for my, for my opinion, and I gave them, you know, multi-page uh, response of, of how to to you know address uh, those different uh, narratives is, is I think people are actually trying to 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 find that out. Um, you know, some other people are shutting down, uh, and that's that's also normal too. Some people are shutting down and and don't want to uh, uh, engage and 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 are just so angry and so lit up right now. And as long as this current uh, you know. Part of the conflict is flaring up as it as it is right now and in, in the most terrible way uh, you're not going to really find it's going to be much more difficult to break through so so the the preparation that we've been doing uh with my family members and everybody else that we're that we're uh sort of looking to the future is to to be in a position once things get to act to 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 a place where the world is not no you know is moving on to the next next issue or the next thing uh, that we are there ready to have these difficult conversations, ready to move into uh, a place where we haven't been before. And so the interfaith work, the again, what I said earlier, holds very true. You're not going to come to a solution without having both sides. And I believe that the other, other countries also have to atone to that, right? A lot of people bring up the fact that Jordan and Egypt uh, had had uh, occupied as well after 1947 those two areas. Why wasn't a Palestinian state created at that point? There's many questions that people can talk about. But until you, if you want to do the Abraham Accords, I'm full for it. But then have them as a part of an atonement section of the peace plan, which includes British, 
which includes France, which includes everyone that had a part to play in the current state of things. If you don't have them all a part of this, then it, it, really, it really just puts it on Israelis and Palestinians only. And unfortunately, where they're at right now, they need help to get past where they're at right now. And that requires the surrounding Arab countries and that requires the other powers in the Western world that have created the facts on the ground. Uh, Imam Rashad, ha has uh, a Palestinian group ever approached you and invited you to have a conversation about Palestine? Because it seems that we're missing something in our community if the other side is inviting you and, and our side, our own community is not inviting you to engage. Well, to, to be fair, uh, Rami, again, uh, Rami Nash, Dr. Rami Nashashibi, uh, yeah. one of the other imams, Imam Mansour Sabri, who was the, he was the imam, he was the resident imam here for about five years prior to me moving here. And he still is an imam in our association. Maybe a couple of weeks later, he went at the invite of a group that Rami himself sponsored. And they were, so we went into Palestine, but we were primarily in Israel, whereas this group, they were primarily in Palestine. Um, and they met a lot of the families who still are in possession of the keys to the homes um, that they were put out of. Um, and they, 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 so they did that. So our community, um, the, the Imam Talib Sharif from um, Masjid Muhammad in DC, he was the head of our delegation, but he had already been to Palestine maybe a couple of months earlier. So he had already heard the first side, the other side, I should say. Um, so we're getting it. We hear it from both ends. All right. Well, just last question to both of you. And thank you so much for, for your time. This has been very illuminating and very important questions that come up uh, from all of your comments. How do we organize and educate our communities to empower Muslims to work together more cohesively for Palestine? We'll start with, uh, with Sam. Well, I think that is part of the work, right? The organization aspect of all the different groups that are now, you know, sort of marching forward, but not necessarily in unison with one another, right? And any movement there has been sort of this central power, even as I read, you know, the autobiography of Martin Luther King. And, you know, there there was a, and, and there's another question here, are there triggering statements, phrases, or words or Palestinians should be more aware of, which I, I'll, I'll get to that as a second part of this. But when you look at those movements, there were people all across the spectrum. Uh, and you see that all across the spectrum. So what we're doing is we're sort of creating profiles or, or identities within each of the uh, each of the groups. And uh, the call I had this morning really did a really good job of saying, all right, well, there's the Israeli center, there's the Israeli right, there's the Israeli left. There's a Palestinian center, it's Palestinian left and Palestinian right. You can do that and create personas for each of these groups Muslims being their own own group here in the United States who also act differently than, say, Malaysia or Indonesia or Saudi Arabia or all that. So taking into consideration uh, of how each of our Muslim communities think and, and sort of creating a through line that connects them all. Because what we need to do is agree upon a certain amount of principle and certain amount of words. And so leading to that second question, are there triggering statements, phrases, or words? When we continue using these words that shut down conversation, then we are getting nowhere. We are literally shouting into our echo chamber. We are entrenching ourselves into our position, and that is not the way forward. So, you know, using words like like genocide, you know, there are if you look at the the different items that actually equate to genocide, there's ten different ones. So you have to look at it. Does it tick a few boxes? Absolutely. Does it tick all the boxes? It does not. And so we need to be able to look at that empirically and ask ourselves when we use these words. In the book, Martin Luther King talks about the fact that there was a, a call to action called Black Power, right? And he was against using this word because it triggered white people here in the United States. It triggered them to a point that it shut down conversation. And he would argue for you know hours and hours and hours till the wee hours in the morning saying hey i don't want to use these terms because it's not helping our cause and the same thing goes with certain phrases that we're using with like free palestine or river to sea etc i really loved what the king of jordan did when he said all people will be free from the river to the sea israelis and palestinians because at the end of the day they're in, they're in, 
intrinsically inclined now to be together and we need to think of them in that way. So if we're using words that are no longer getting us where we need to go, then we need to rethink those words. And we need to look at where Muslims here are and around the world and people of good conscience are around the world and create that through line so that we are aligned in how we speak about this conflict and how we progress. Imam Rashad. Yes. The last um, word. How do we educate our communities? How, how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we uh, come, I, get, I think more is more educate uh, and empower, but to work more cohesively. Mm. Well, this may sound cliche, but I, I really just believe it boils down to living Islam. Um, uh, that means a lot. I, 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 the, the black community, we tend to have this problem. You know, I have a, um, several friends who own businesses, African-Americans, and they actually, they have the record. Uh, their sales go up whenever someone gets shot by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so they, they made a killing during the George Floyd protest era. And then afterward, mm. everything goes back down. Mm. So in large part, the black community is reactionary. I think that we, whether intentional or not, we tend to be, as Muslim Americans, we can be reactionary as it pertains to these issues. Um, and the key is not to be. Um, the key is to be conscious of our brothers and sisters in the world at all times and with an awareness of their state, work to establish Muslim life here in America. Um, so it's a difficult question to answer if the premise of the question is what can we do about Palestine now that this is going on? because more than likely we'll come up with a band-aid solution because we weren't working together prior to now. So I think that um, we have to really register um, uh, the, the, the fact that we are actually brothers and sisters in Al-Islam and we're brothers and sisters in humanity. And we have to ask ourselves as Muslim Americans, what is our agenda? What is the Muslim agenda? What is our purpose here as Muslims? And how are we establishing the Ummah of Muhammad in the right way here in America? It, without giving uh, due consideration to these, what I would consider to be fundamentals, I think that what, we, what we'll come up with, it will be satisfactory in the short term, but not necessarily the long term. Um, I hope that's not too vague. <laughs> but, no, no, it's very important. No, it's very important. Yes. Appreciate, uh, I, I appreciate your uh, honesty, brutal honesty that we need uh, at this time. So uh, I thank you both for joining us and for uh, your wisdom and, and guidance uh, based on your experiences. Uh, even though you, t you come from two different sectors, uh, we see the, the commonality of uh, both of your work and I believe, uh, as, as you both said, we really need to stress the issue of common humanity uh, as we move forward. And I think that's how Islam can really be a contribution to America by stressing the common humanity and, and guiding the policies of our decision makers in our country so that it avoids war in solving these very uh, difficult problems that we're facing in the Middle East uh, and also here on our own streets. In, in America itself. I think there's that commonality of dealing with racism and bigotry and uh, injustice uh, and the inequities uh, in life that we need to stress the human security over national security, that we need to think about the rights of people and not geopolitics, not just geopolitics of the states that we need to bolster as allies and bring down uh, those people that we don't wanna hear from. Uh, and when it comes to Israel, at the end of the day, it is in a Muslim world. Uh, and if it wants to be integrated into the Muslim world, then it has to start respecting, first and foremost, the rights of Palestine and the sanctity of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, for every year, every Ramadan, Israeli troops going into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that's not the way to, uh, to promote reconciliation and integration. 
Uh, that's showing that you don't respect uh, the people that, that really established Jerusalem as a sanctuary for Jews. It was the Muslims that brought the Jews back to Jerusalem after the downfall of the Roman uh, Empire. And it was uh, the Muslim world that the Jewish communities who were suffering from pogroms in Europe, they fled to Muslim lands to seek protection. So we find that that narrative is missing in the understanding of the region. Uh, and, and it's our job as religious leaders, faith leaders, and leaders in, in, in shaping public opinion, uh, like Sam is working in, to at least let people know of this narrative and that that needs to be part of the conversation. The Islamic narrative of Jerusalem as a place for religious freedom and a place for all religions that Islam at least um, demanded from us. And we as Muslims, uh, by and large, respected and adhered to those rules. And, and now after the British took over and now the state of Israel has taken over, uh, we see anything and everything but that. Uh, so we hope that we can continue this very important conversation uh, and bring communities together uh, towards that human security goal of freedom uh, for human rights and, and freedom uh, from fear, uh, from the violence that millions of Palestinians are, are suffering from uh, to this day. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, Imam Rashad Abdurrahman from Masjid yeah. al-Islam in Atlanta, uh, Sam Bland. Uh, from the great uh, uh, sectors of uh, Hollywood and, and uh, here in Los Angeles. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.